Well, it's good to be here again. I, I never tire of coming to Northfield and never tire of coming to this uh, great auditorium and the surrounding of the legacy of revival uh, that's here. Let's just begin with a word of prayer and we'll get right into what I want to talk about. I'm going to be addressing the theme of the conference, Kissed by the Sun, Revive and Reform. Lord, we come to you right now. You are the God of truth. You are truth. That will not change. We thank you for the things that have already been said last night, this morning. We ask you, God, that you'd help us to now focus them also on the things that we must consider if we're truly going to be a part of your revival and your reformation. So we'll thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to look at Psalm 2, where this phrase comes from, in just a moment. But what I would like to do right now is to just talk just a brief moment about where we are, Northfield, and I want to highlight several things you can write down. These are premises, presuppositions, things that are true in the Word of God, illustrated in the Word of God that you can hang on to, you can stand on. The first are the patterns of generations in revival. The Bible makes it very clear that God's fullness and manifestation that goes from revival to reformation is requiring a minimum of three consecutive generations. How many remember when Moses was uh, going to go and deliver the Israelites and uh, Joshua was uh, also with him and it was said clearly in this revelation, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, that's not just a phrase, that's three generations. If you look at it in Scripture, you find out that two consecutive generations is valiant. But when you come to the third, second to the third generation, it is tremendously difficult. In fact, if you look at the book of Malachi at the end of the Old Testament, you find out that the same thing is true. When the fathers do not pass the truth down unto the next generation, you have their maintaining of a curse in the earth. You find out that Scripture is very clear about these things, but now let's just apply it briefly to where we are right now. The pilgrims came in 1620, the Puritans came in 1630, and those were both coming at the peak of a revival. They were surfing at the highest wave, so to speak. The revival took place for decades in England prior to them coming, but they got on board the ship, they formed their covenants, and they came over here willing to sacrifice because they were in revival. Revival was in their hearts. That was at the peak. And when they came here, the question would now be, how many generations could they have to maintain it? The first question we have, we could often answer. For repentance and prayer, we know births revival. But the key question is why revivals stop. We wouldn't need to be revived if we maintained viving. Vive, life, in God. So therefore, the question would have to be, what happened? Well, the next second generation, to a large degree, of the pilgrims and Puritans did receive that mantle of revival. And they continued. That Reformation continued to the 1650s and 60s. Many things were taking place that are positive, not part of my remarks now. However, from the second to the third generation, we had a major problem here in New England. Uh, the Halfway Covenant, the Salem Witch Trials, King Philip's War, all these broken treaties with Native Americans and other aspects came on the scene. And there was a major problem between the second and third generation. Now you need to realize that in the first generation of Puritans, this area, Northfield, is the, considered the most western outpost of Puritanism. This was a Puritan town established here in the midst of revival. Northfield in its mountains, with the mountains and the river, it was a very strong outpost for revival. It survived in the 1600s. It went through the same ebb and flow that I've described. But the second set of three generations occurs when the repentance comes for the Salem Witch Trials in 1706, 1708, where there's repentance in the church for how the church let down the standard for the culture. Keep this in mind. Whatever God does in the church will be seen in the culture. What you see in the culture is merely a reflection of what was in the church one to two generations before. 
It's not a one-to-one correspondence, but the way the church operates will be the way the culture operates later on. God designed it that way. That's why it's very important. Someone put it this way, when, when the church coughs, the culture gets a cold. But this, you might say, oh, that sounds really great. That makes the church very important. It also makes the church very responsible when the culture is looking the way it is today. Because what we see in the culture is a better representation than what is actually in the church. See, you and I need to come to grips with this. That's why the multi-generational vision is so important. We see the repentance come in the early 1700s and they come to Christ and they, and they come and they rededicate their lives to Christ. And then the second generation picks up that baton. See, Jonathan Edwards was only a teenager when he played the revival game in the woods. The revivals were already going on in the churches. The second generation picked up that mantle and that second generation were the parents of the founders of our country. They endeavored to pass on to the ne- that next generation those truths. And that's what was the fruit of the Great Awakening was the American Revolution and the Constitution and the Declaration. But we need to recognize that very generation that formed a government, the manifestation of the kingdom, did not train their children with any great consistency. And we saw another falling away, so much so that by the 1800, 1805, 1808, there was a longing for another revival. And indeed, that came with the repentance and the amazing grace-filled outreach of the Second Great Awakening. And the Second Great Awakening, though that Second Great Awakening, they did not pass the torch onto their own children. And the result was the calamity of the war between the states. Slavery was not addressed from the pulpit. They were too afraid of what tithers would do and not not pay their tithes in the church if they would in any way discipline slave owners. The church dropped the ball on slavery and we paid for it in the culture. We could go on and on and recognize right up till today the generation that was before me. My mentor was Russ Walton, John Talcott of Plymouth, Russ Walton up in New Hampshire, and these individuals. That was a generation before me. They passed on that torch to me. The question is going to be whether we're passing it on to the next generation. Whether they will be, whether they, it's in the balance, folks, right now. You and I need to recognize we stand on the cusp of a phenomenal wave of revival. You need to recognize that. I say that because we're standing right in the well of one of the major revivals of the 1800s. Now more I will say about that, but I recognize this. The same. So I would just put it this way. Here's your premise. What happens in the church will end up in the culture. Therefore, be careful that whatever God is doing now, constantly think, how can this be passed and caught by the next generation? If you only think of the past and only think of the present, you will not see the manifestation of the kingdom to the degree that you could. Second premise I want to lay very quickly, and that is the place of unity. We hear a lot about unity in revival. We know John 17, 21 says that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So we see a very good cause and effect here. The world is going to come to believe based on the nature and presence of unity in the body of Christ. But this tells us something very clearly, which is another premise. Unity is not the end Unity is the means to an end. Unity is not the goal. Unity is the method by which God reaches the goal. All movements have stagnated throughout church history when people have begun to think that unity is their ultimate goal, to be one. Then they end up negotiating away the non-negotiables. They end up with an ecumenical form of quasi-unity, which is uniformity. And therefore, it does not work. That's not doesn't it bring revival. It brings compromise. It brings the need for more repentance. It brings the need for devastation. So you and I have to recognize unity is the means to an end. The end is that God gets the glory. The end is that his kingdom comes. The end is that people come to Christ because they see we're willing to lay down our ego trips, lay down our own ministries and kingdoms and say it's for your kingdom, Lord, not my kingdom that we're here. 
Indeed, this became so well known, this idea of unity. Dwight Moody exemplified right here. In fact, he wrote about the Northfield Conference this way. The central idea of the Northfield Conference is Christian unity. The invitation is to all denominations and to all wings of denominations, but it is understood that along with the idea of Christian unity goes the Bible as it stands. In other words, Moody recognized this is not unity as a goal. If you can't stand for the Bible, you weren't on this stage. If you can't stand for the divinity of Christ, you weren't invited. In fact, people don't know the other side of Dwight Moody. He got wind in a conference that one of the speakers arriving by train right down at the bottom of this hill where there was a train station, arriving by train was a speaker who had admitted to somebody else that he got invited to the stage. You see, Moody invited people on the stage that didn't like each other. It was common for him to do that. The guy on this stage that's going to speak next has written a book against the guy on the other part of the stage. They don't like each other. They're divided from each other. They're in different denominations, and therefore they couldn't get along. Moody, smiling, invited them both so they could hear each other's messages and lay down a bit of pride for Christian unity. And yet Moody got wind that someone was going to take advantage of being on this stage and preach their pet doctrines. He said, first, you don't believe the Bible, then don't come. But secondarily, if you do come and you preach your peripheral preferences and minor doctrines in order to hijack the audience that you have to promote your personal ministry, I will deal with you. Now everybody said, Moody, yes, he's the guy that rode his donkey, gave out candy for kids to come to Christ. He's the smiling evangelist. But when he got wind, he went down to the train station. And when the guy arrived by train, he asked to meet with him. You can see in there, he's got this little cane. He's a big guy. Not as tall as me. But he asked him, he said, were you planning to do this in the sessions here? Well, he admitted, yes, I did say that. He said, there's another train coming in 20 minutes. Be on it. He disinvited him. Nobody in the conference knew about this. But you have to understand that if unity is not the goal, that must be the case. There will be issues where you're going to have to stand for truth. I want to tell you, because Moody was more interested in pleasing God than people, we're still here today. He, he, he made it clear, take the Bible, study it, leave that criticism stuff to the theologians. Feed on the Word, go out to work, combine the two, study and work. If you'd be a full-orbed Christian, the Bible is assailed as never before. The infidels cast it overboard, but somehow it always swims to shore. Well, that's moody for you. You recognize those are two premises. The third premise I submit to you, as I simply work now in just a moment through Psalm 2, and we'll just highlight them, is this. Moody desired and really believed that the heartfelt foundation for revival was to present the gospel as simply as possible. The simple gospel needs to be presented because there is power in the simple gospel. You don't have to manipulate it, you just present it. The Holy Spirit uses it, and after all, you don't get anybody saved. It's God who saves people. It's not you. So you simply present it. Now, he loved simply presenting the Scriptures. And now if you know it, sing along with me. My heart was dark with sin. Until the Savior came in, his precious blood I know has washed me white as snow. And in God's word I'm told I'll walk the streets of gold to grow in Christ each day. I'll read my Bible and pray. Now that became very common. You know why? Because Charles Spurgeon, anybody hear of him? 
over in London had created a book in 1866 called the Wordless Book. It was simple colors. My heart was dark with sin, and he put up black until the Savior came in. His precious blood, and he put up red. I know has washed me white as snow, and he'd put up white. Dwight Moody, because he was great friends with Spurgeon, he saw this and he goes, hey, he was on good terms. He said, Charles, you've got to add the color gold. You forgot heaven. That's part of the simple truth. So Spurgeon added gold. And then Child Evangelism Fellowship in 1939 added green because both Spurgeon and Moody were so strong on discipleship and growth. You don't just receive Christ and go to the corner. You grow in him. And we have this simple truth of the gospel. Sung, easily presented. By the word, the wordless book is now in every nation of the world. As the simplest way to present the gospel. So the gospel can be presented how? Simply. What God does with that seed can be complex. But what we do in presenting it ought to be simple. Now when we look at Psalm 2, and Psalm 2 is in four sections of three verses each. It addresses four different, four different speakers are in Psalm 12 in an allegory. And we find this clearly. You recognize that when we look at these principles, when we look at these premises, we should be able to see, and I want to illustrate it with Dwight Moody's life, why this conference was called Kiss the Sun, Re Revive First, and then Reform. First of all, the first three verses. Think of this clearly. Why do the nations rage? Why do the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands in pieces, cast away their cords from us. Now first of all, the first key point of Moody's theology is we've all been ruined by the fall. Why do nations rage because of the fall? Why do people always plot vain things naturally because of the fall? Why do the kings of the earth and their civil rulers seem to take counsel together and they actually become unified when it's against the Lord and his anointed because of the fall? And why do they say, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us because of the fall? Never forget that the target of sin is the unity of you with God and with one another. It's a covenant. It's the cords. There always that focus is to break it and to cause disunity. How many know in the gospel over and over we read that uh, all of a sudden civil rulers that were enemies normally got along when they both opposed Jesus? You know, it's not very deep friendship, but the point is, they'll get along when they have a common enemy. So it is. Ruined by the fall. In other words, you, you and I have to understand simply that when we look at a culture we have today, we should not be shocked by the ruin that comes from the fall. I mean, our Christians have come to me and they said, can you believe that the media just said that? Yeah. We're ruined by the fall. Moody was always this way. People would come to Moody all the time, and he very, was very convinced that sinners would act like sinners. Now why, he said, why would you expect a sinner to act like a saint? He said, well, part of the problem is too many saints act like sinners. Why is that? And he would say this. Now, let me, I'll just give you an example. Uh, he was uh, really interested. He was an interesting. Moody was an interesting character. I've compiled quotes of Moody and put them all in categories, and I, I, I love these things. Well, this is, these were his rules in handling the media. I, you know, any, any relevance to today is purely conjectural. He said, number one, don't expect the media to cover the Christian conference. No. They're just ruined by the fall. 
But he said this, when God works, they can't ignore it. We don't need the secular media to advertise God's work. But God, by the numbers, will bring it to their attention. And whenever you receive criticism, I like this one. I never respond to critics unless they, uh, they accuse me of mishandling money. When they accuse me of mishandling money, I have the books shown to them that Dwight Moody makes not a dime from any of his ministry. Dwight Moody does not live in a great house, different from his neighbors. Dwight Moody does not drive in a carriage, different from his neighbors. I live like the common person because the glory goes to God. Again, any relevance to any problems we have today? Just conjecture. He became friends of editors, though. He said, I'm very friendly to the, all the editors and then they like to come and see what I'm doing. I never respond to a critic. One time a critic wrote to him and said, you're a heretic, Dwight, because you had this person on the stage and this person on the stage. And they're not of the same denomination. Come on, pick and choose. Which, where, where are you? Where, are your theolo where is your theology? So he wrote and he said to the, a reporter came to him and said, in the Detroit Journal, they said to him, well, Dwight Moody, come on, take a stand. Who are you with and who are you against? He said, well, some people in Minneapolis, the other declared that my theology is about 30 years old. Well, if I was sure it was, old, it was not 6,000 years old, I'd pitch it into the Mississippi. I believe that sin is the same today as then, and the remedy is the same as well. That's my theology. Next question. They didn't get what they were looking for. And he basically said, they believe in Jesus. They believe in Jesus. They adhere to the Word. They adhere to the Word. They see it differently. I have them together. They might see it differently when they leave. You see, Dwight Moody understood this. And he understood that the ruin of the fall made all nations tend toward monarchy and centralization. He knew, though he hadn't got all the statistics like we have today. Historians know if they look at every single government of every single nation that has ever existed from recorded history to today, 95 to 97 percent of all nations that have ever existed have existed in centralized monarchy where there are very little rights in the people. Therefore, only three to 5%, which is being very generous throughout history, have ever experienced freedom of choice in any area. 3 to 5%, folks, were in the minority. A vast minority. Why? Why would centralization of power and people giving so much power to one person or a few be so popular? We are ruined by the fall. But then... The psalm goes on. The next three verses, which is now the Father speaking. Father God. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord will hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath, distress them in his deep displeasure. Because yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion. The second R is clear. Revelation of the love of the Father. Not only are we ruined by the fall, but Father God wants to reveal the focus of the solution. I have set my king on my holy hill. This is amazing because you see this very clearly. This is a key that Christ is the focus. What do we want to do? We want to demonstrate the love of the Father. No matter what you learn, what you understand, how you think a culture could be changed, what political nuances should change, who should be elected, and you need to have your opinions and you need to do your research. I'd be the last person to tell you not to study it. I study it. I've studied it for years. But I also know there comes a time also when I recognize that regardless of how I'm going to vote, regardless of what issue I stand on or against, whatever I stand in, I must, first of all, be a vessel that reveals the love of the Father in the midst of the calamity. 
The calamity is that which God will use to reveal the Son on His holy hill. If that is the means by which God will bring it to pass. You and I have to say, God, help me to be a revelation of the Father's love toward my neighbors, toward those that disagree with me. If the church, if the individual believer cannot reveal the love of the Father to their neighbor, regardless of what political party they're on. Years ago, I'm not registered Democrat. I'm not registered Republican. I am independent. I want my people to know that out of my neighbors, I am for them, and it is not politics first. Politics is the exhaust. Love is the cause. I want that to come forth when I speak to people. I'm polarizing enough. I don't need more things to add to it. But I can tell you this, my goal Say, God, would your love show through, shine through me in such a way that even though people have been ruined by the fall and don't know it, they'll be loved by the Father and know it. And understand it by the way I act, by my facial expressions, by my body language. I often ask believers, how many non-Christians do you know by first name who know you as a friend? A non-Christian that knows you as a friend, that you know you disagree with, that you're on the opposite side with politically or other areas. That list for me has been growing for more than 20 years, 20 to 25 years. I realized as a pastor, I made a serious mistake in thinking that my whole ministry should be dedicated to dealing with Christians. I want to shepherd my town I want to shepherd my neighbors, but you can't shepherd them by parachuting in, dropping a card down their chimney, saying, by the way, I'm here, and then preach. No. Love people. Get to know them. Get to know what's on their heart. Ask them how you can pray for them. How can you build relationships? We will never show the love of the Father to those whom God is shedding it abroad unless we get to know them. I can tell you today, my schedule every week includes a large percentage of time meeting with non-Christians in the town. Oh, is that ever refreshing. I'll let a little bit of a secret. I have more problems tolerating Christians who won't listen to the Bible than I do non-Christians who know nothing about it. I get revived. And I want to know how God, and notice what God says. His displeasure in these verses is not against the individual people. It's against the centralized, tyrannical institutions that have arisen because of the fall. It's clear when God says, that he is angry. He's angry at the systems that have been produced because of that ignorance. But in the midst of that oppression, oh, may the love of the Father come forth. May the revelation of God's love come forth. A third R. We're looking now at the third set of this. Before I even get there, let me just give you a quote from Dwight Moody again. He says, I find the better I love, the more enjoyment I have. And the more I think of God and His love, the less I think of the world's troubles. Don't let anything keep you from the full enjoyment of God's love. I think if we have things sometimes come upon us to try our faith, and God likes to see us cling on. As the psalmist says in one place, God likes to chasten those whom He loves. If we have got the true love of God shed abroad in our hearts, we will show it in our lives. We will not have to go up and down the earth proclaiming it. We will show it in everything we do or say. For there is not a better evangelist in the entire world than the Holy Spirit. He then said this, I can never preach on hell unless I preach it with tears. The world will never understand theology or dogma, but oh, how it understands love and sympathy. You see, the revelation of Father God's love was so dear to his heart, so clear. 
fact, one time he was preaching on the Great Commission. And when he was preaching on the Great Commission, he said these words. I can only imagine that when Christ said to the little band of disciples around him, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, Peter must have said, Lord, you really mean that we're to go back to Jerusalem and preach the gospel to those people that just, just murdered you? Remember, he's risen now. Because he said, preach the gospel, and what does Acts 1 say? Start in where? Jerusalem. This is like a death sentence. Yes! Christ probably said, go hunt up that man that spat in my face and tell him that he may have a seat in my kingdom yet. Yes, Peter, go find that man that made that cruel crown of thorns and placed it on my brow. Tell him I will have a crown ready for him when he comes into my kingdom. And there will be no thorns in that one. Hunt up that man that took a reed brought it down upon the cruel thorns driving them into my brow, and tell him I will put a scepter in his hand and he'll rule over the nations of the earth if he will accept my salvation. Search for that man that drove the spear into my side. Tell him there is a nearer way to my heart than that. Tell him I forgive him freely, that he can come and be saved if he will accept salvation as a gift. You know, I don't often dream of those kinds of words. But now we go to that third set. Ruined by the fall. The Father's love, the revelation of the Father's love. And now the redemption of the Son. Now the Son speaks. We've seen the world speak. The Father speak. Now the Son. The Lord has said to me, You are my Son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. What on earth? How would the Son speak in such a way? You know this verse was, of course, quoted in the New Testament. But here Jesus says, God the Father spoke to me. You are my son. Today, eternally today, I have begotten you. Eternal equality, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Different roles and functions. Ask of me and I will give you the inheritance of the nations as your possession. Folks, not only do people have a destiny in the kingdom of God, nations have a destiny. There's an inheritance of nations that awaits the manifestation of his kingdom. And the son then says all of these things and recognizes that you shall break them. Who? Who shall break them? It's God speaking to the son. It's again breaking the tyrannical, oppressive systems that put keep people in bondage. The slave owner had hope in Christ as much as the slave had hope in Christ. But oh, how God hated the system of oppression that kept the slave owned by the master. The wrath of God would come upon those systems. And yes, those individuals that wanted to perpetuate them. But we must recognize God's love for the individual and recognize this key truth. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes into a person's heart through redemption, think of that simple song. My heart was dark with sin until the Savior came in. You need to recognize how unique this is. There is no other religion on earth where the king and founder of the religion dwells inside his subjects. Every other religion keeps the God, the King, a long distance from the subjects. you got to travel a long way to get the decree. you got to get it through successive commands that will reach you and the outer part of the kingdom. How does this work? You are a subject under a centralized monarchy. 
Because the centralized, monarchical system of oppression that does not believe you can trust anyone with unalienable rights, because of that system is the way it is, you dwell far from God. Uh, think of it this way. When the Portuguese got on their ships and came to sail to discover new lands, when the Spanish got on their ships and came, when others, the further they sailed from their homeland, the further they sailed from their rights. Their rights remained in the crown back in the home country. Are you with me? So when they got here, they realized that there's merely vassals. The rights don't go with them. Now, England was no better and no better with all their human uh, machinations than anyone else. But one thing England did have by the grace of God. They had a different philosophy of Christianity. And Christianity's philosophy was simply this. Because the king came in and dwelt inside of you, the rights you have are inseparable with you from creation. They go with you. What made the American Revolution so unique is when Patrick Henry stood up there in Williamsburg and he stood up, he quoted the, doc the documents from the 1600s and say, the king can't take away our rights. God gave them to us. They're inside our hearts. But this because this is why the gospel is so unique. The gospel says Jesus Christ, by the power of his forgiveness, as you repent of your sin, can come by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he lives inside your heart, which is why self-government is the government of the kingdom. Because it's inside out, it's bottom up. It is not top down. It does not come from the outside. It comes from within. How will these vessels get shattered, like this psalm says? From the inside out and the bottom up. How it gets shattered when each individual Christian lives out their faith. When they're truly recognized that when they walk into their neighbor's home and ask them how can they pray for them. They know that the power of the Holy Spirit is right there in the living room, just as powerful as it was in the tabernacle by the mercy seat. That the power of God is right there. That I'm an ambassador of the kingdom of God. And I can smile and look at someone and tell them that because I know the king lives within me. This is the most bottom-up, inside-out kingdom that has ever existed on the face of the globe. It is so unique, no image of a centralized monarchy with palaces and plants that sometime, somehow you have to get into the throne room you have to have the right keys to get in to get close to the monarch. The monarch has come and lives inside our hearts by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the most powerful concept ever introduced. It upends every other kingdom. It smashes every bondage. To be redeemed from the inside out is powerful. Dwight Moody put it this way, when I first became a Christian, I thought I'd be glad when I got farther on and got established. I thought I would be so strong that there would be no danger. But the longer I live, the more danger I see. The only hope of the Christian is to keep hold of Christ. Moody knew clearly that you don't, in your travels, far, go far away. If I'm 50 miles from my church, I must be 50 miles from God. No. If Christ dwells within you, you hold on to Christ. That's what keeps the church together. You don't hold on to the church. We're never told to preach the gospel of the church. We're told to preach the gospel of the kingdom. There's a distinct difference. We preach the gospel of the kingdom because then God comes in and the king lives inside his subject. Dwight Moody knew it. He said this, There is no greater pleasure of living than to win souls to Christ. You may find hundreds of fault finders among professed Christians, but all their criticism will not lead one solitary soul to Christ. Why spend so much time, he said, criticizing? Do more time lifting up Christ, and you will win people to him. So you see, here's this clarity. We're ruined by the fall. But the love of the Father is revealed to us 
by the grace of God. We can be redeemed by the Son when we realize He paid our price on the cross. The fetters of oppression can be broken wherever Christians go and begin to live as salt and light in their society. Those are where the oppressions are broken. Someone said, I can't go to Washington. I don't know all the right people. I can't get the right laws passed. Christianity does not depend on the right laws passed. It means Christ is throned in the individual. You minister, as Dwight Moody said one time, he said, everybody wants to do a big thing for God. Why don't we do the little things for Christ like in our own neighborhoods and in our known areas? We don't realize that the kingdom of God will manifest in those smaller areas powerfully to allow his kingdom to come, his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So it was. Dwight Moody understood this clearly. That's why he wanted people to be regenerated by the Holy Spirit, reunited with God through Christ, the power of God to come upon him. That's why when those two ladies would always sit in the front row in the early 1870s, I mean, Auntie Cook, I mean, it drove Moody crazy. Auntie Cook, have you ever met an intercessor that wouldn't give up? Auntie Cook sat in the front row. After every sermon, she'd go up and say, Good sermon, Brother Moody. One day you'll preach with power. Oh, it'd make him so mad. Man, he'd get so upset. She said, You need an encounter with the living God and the power of the Holy Ghost. And Moody would just go, didn't know what to do. And of course, until he had an encounter with God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he recognized that this can't be intellectual, as we've already heard. It's got to be of God himself. Now therefore, it says, be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Now the Hebrew word for kiss is an interesting word. It has two roots. The first is that you adjust yourself according to the priorities of God. So kiss is a symbol of surrender. It's a betrothal. It's a commitment. There is a commitment to surrender to God. God's priorities become your priorities. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Put things in right order. What God says is first, second, third. The second part of this meaning of this Hebrew word is that mean then you are formed together into a team to advance. Actually, one part of the word means to arm yourself with weapons. Another part means you go forth. It reminded me clearly when I studied this years ago of the two silver trumpets given to Israel in Numbers chapter 10. There in verse 2, it was said that there's a, uh, a trumpet sound. And when the trumpet, the shofar, is sounded with a specific unique tune, a specific unique call, Israel was to assemble. They were to assemble properly in priority and order. They were to come together. They were to submit to God, submit to His truth under His priorities. You come together. And then the, when the second trumpet would sound, you then march forth in formation. Now many of you know that when you march forth in formation in Israel, Judah had to go first. You notice the tribes had an order in how they were going. This was not like, pick up your stuff and run. We're going to war. I know. You go first. You follow behind. You take care of the Ark of the Covenant. You make sure it's carried only one way, on staves. Don't you touch that thing. It's not to be done by flesh. This is shouldered. Shoulders the symbol of the kingdom. You do it on your shoulders, and you take that Ark forward. You do it in order, God's way. And when you do, you will be equipped with every weapon you need because we need the weapon of the covering of God himself. That's the way it's going to work. It's not going to work. Well, I got these weapons and that one, and I can win an argument, and I can deal with this. Folks, 
Winning an argument, you can still lose the war. What you need to do, and I need to do, is come into priorities with God. This idea means, this, this calling, we means we are dual citizens. We are citizens of heaven, and we're citizens of earth. We have responsibilities to God, that's our priority, and we have responsibilities to our own towns, our villages. And I say those first because I have a greater responsibility to my neighborhood than I do to some other foreign country. I will answer for how I've treated my neighbors, whether I've ignored them or whether they catch me on the go again, coming in, going out, coming in, going out, never talking to them at the mailbox, never getting to know their name, never asking them what's troubling them, never getting to know them. Wrong. You and I need to recognize our priorities need to be straightened out by God. To kiss the sun means we need to come into revival first. We need a relationship with God first. Oh, that I might be in revival, God. Then secondarily, may I move forward in order with your team, your believers, in how we are to serve, what we are to do. May I do it in your order, God, that it might be successful in your timing, in your way. On priorities, Moody said this, the enemy has now come in like a flood. It is time for those who believe in a supernatural religion to look up to God, to lift up a standard against him. Oh, for a revival of such power that the tide of unbelief and worldliness sweeping in upon us shall be beaten back that every Christian shall be lifted to a higher level of life and power, and the multitudes of perishing souls be converted to God. I believe the sound of the going in the tops of the mulberry trees are already being heard. The history of revivals, he writes, proves that such a work must begin in the house of God. Who can doubt that if somehow the church could be thoroughly aroused, not a mere scratching of the surface of our emotions, but a deep heart work that shall make us right with God and clothe us with power in prayer and service? The last months of this century would witness the mightiest movements of the Holy Spirit since Pentecost. The whole aim of this conference is to help bring it about. This is his letter. His last letter before he died. That this conference would do it if Christians would get their priorities on God. Yes, go ahead, listen to the news. Get the information. Make sure you get it straight and you understand it. But our focus is on seeking first the kingdom of God. Then all these things shall be added unto me. And then the priorities are right. As Moody said, then we'll work together. Then this second part of this word will come to pass. Discipleship. This is his own manager, Percy Fitt, who writes in his book, The Life of Moody. He said it became Moody's custom very early to invite neighbors and visitors to his home for Bible readings as he has done in his Chicago home. See, by the way, when he came over here to Northfield, he was going to have vacations every summer. So Emma said to him, his wife said, uh, Strange, I kind of figured this would happen. Moody's idea of a vacation was to invite the world to Northfield. He said, that's a hard, far better use of my time. I've been traveling to the world for a number of years. Why not bring the world here? In 1879, he started Northfield Seminary for Girls on land adjoining his own house. September 1880, he saw the first of the famous Northfield Bible Conferences. Mount Hermon School for Boys, founded in 1881. Annual College Student Conferences in 1886. Northfield Training School for Women was opened up to the hotel in the fall of 1890. A young women's conference was held in 1893. The magazine Northfield Echoes began publishing in 1894. Eastern Depot of the Bible Institute, Cole Portage Association of Chicago, was established in 1895. Camp North Northfield in 1895. The record, record of Christian work came to Northfield in 1898. This, this auditorium was built in 1894, and it was built while Moody was alive. And when he came in, he said, they're good. We can assemble the believers and arm them and equip them to go forth and see the kingdom of God come on earth as it is in heaven. May we begin to say, oh God, 
May we kiss you in the way you desire, surrendering to you. May your priorities be our priorities. May loving you, loving our neighbor, take precedence over being right in our arguments. May love win the day. And then, God, would you put us in order under your discipline that we would know how to work together, together so it's not pride, it's not ego. These conferences here, I pray, will always maintain that standard. It is not who is this speaker, that speaker, what their name is. It's Jesus Christ. His kingdom, may his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. God bless you.